Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thank you so much for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really delighted to be joined by Norm Ornstein, who's one of the leading political thinkers and analysts in the United States today. Let me tell you a little bit about Norm, and then we will go right into a great conversation. Um, Norm is a native of Minnesota, attended the University of Minnesota as an undergraduate, earned a doctorate at the University of Michigan, um, and then taught for about a decade at Catholic University in D.C., had a great teaching career there, and then he moved to the American Enterprise Institute, where he's had this really storied career for, for a number of decades. Um, you see him on TV a lot. He writes for uh, major publications all the time, has written a number of really important books, two of which are on my bookshelf. The first one is called The Broken Branch, which came out in 2006. The subtitle is How Congress is a Failing America and How to Get It Back on Track. And then six years later, in 2012, he and his, actually his co-author, Thomas Mann, wrote a book called It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. Two really, really important books. As I mentioned, Norm is um, on TV a lot and is on task forces and is just one of the, the leading political thinkers in the United States. So, so Norm, good morning. Good morning to you, John. Good to see you. Great. And I might even say just so, uh, people sometimes say to me, you know, how do you get your, your authors? Well, Norm, <laughs> Norm's journey here is an unusual one in that we met this summer on a boat at the, uh, we were both attending the Chautauqua Institution and we were on a steamboat one beautiful Saturday morning. And I was on the boat with my wife and I looked over and I said, I think that's Norm Ornstein. So at the appropriate time, I went over and introduced myself and we had a great chat. Norm was had a lot to say about Paul Simon, who he knew quite well. We ended up having a long talk about American politics ended up going out for ice cream with our wives afterwards. So really kind of a fun way to get to know Norm. And Norm, hey, let's just begin with that, with, with Paul Simon, just a, a reflection or two. I know you knew him well and had a lot of kind of uh, thoughts about just his legacy and the kind of career he had. So, uh, John, I uh, have been in Washington since uh, pretty much since 1969-70. Worked on the Hill some. Uh, I uh, was a staff director for a committee in 1976-77 that reorganized the committee system. And I got to know a wide range of members of the Senate, uh, the, the, even more in the House. But I got to know Paul when he came to the Senate and uh, got to know him pretty well. And I would often see him and see his wife uh, sometimes at airports, sometimes at events. Um, we had a really nice relationship and friendship. I thought he was so much in the legacy of Paul Douglas, um, somebody who had this enormous uh, uh, and deep desire to make the country better and to make the Senate work better. He had the kind of values that you want in public servants. And we will get to this, but it is sorely lacking in so many uh, in uh, the Senate right now. Um, I had one uh, significant disagreement with Paul. And uh, that continued over several years. I tried so hard to move him on this. And that was his passionate desire to get a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And uh, it was something that I think he felt from his gut and from his soul. He was one of these uh, liberals who also believed in fiscal probity. All that's good. But I tried to tell him that a constitutional amendment to balance the budget was an insane and destructive idea. And we won't go into all of the details here, but let's put it this way. Um, almost every state, just a couple of exceptions, have in their own state constitutions a requirement to balance their budgets. Now, what that means is that when you hit a recession or a difficult time and their revenues decline, 
they have to take draconian measures to achieve that goal. What the federal government is able to do under those circumstances is what we call counter-cyclical policy. They can try and get the economy moving again. When you're in a recession, you don't want to do what is the equivalent of the medieval practice of bleeding. Uh, you probably remember, John, I suspect some of the people uh, who are uh, tuning in do as well, those who are of a certain age, a great Saturday Night Live skit with Steve Martin, where he played the medieval doctor, and people would come to him with severed limbs, with uh, horrible uh, health problems. And he would say, what you need is a bleeding. And they would take more blood away from them. Then they'd come back an hour later, even paler and even worse shape. And they would be bled even more. They would in inevitably die. And at the end, uh, Steve Martin said, what if we're wrong about this? What if <laughs> taking more blood from anemic patients actually makes it worse and leads to their death? And then he looked up at the sky and he said, nah. But that's what the constitutional amendment to balance the budget would do. It would take away our ability to get out of a recession with a stimulus. And I tried and tried with Paul, but it was just such a deep-seated idea. But that aside, he was just a wonderful human being and a model of what we want in public service. Great. Well, Norm, let's let's go back to your kind of first work with Congress. Um, you, I, I believe, came to D.C. in 69 um, as part of the American Political Association yeah. Congressional Fellowship Program, which is this really storied and, and important program. So talk about that program and also as it launched your career at Catholic U, because the thing that's most striking to me is I think a lot of political scientists who cover Congress actually don't live in town, which maybe has some some benefits, but um, but it but it doesn't allow them the proxim proximity to actually meet lawmakers and have meetings and so forth. So so talk about your kind of pull into the congressional world. So um, I, as an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, I had as a professor a man named Gene Eidenberg. Uh, Gene. Uh, was at the University of Minnesota, had come there from his own congressional fellowship, where he had worked for Hale Boggs, who was then the uh, majority whip in the House. And uh, he sat across from uh, a man named D.B. Hardiman, who was a legendary figure who had actually been the top aide to Speaker Sam Rayburn. Uh, and I was just intrigued by... Uh, what Gene did. He later moved on to the University of Illinois and then to the Carter White House. Um, but I said, I want to do that. So from graduate school, as soon as I had the opportunity, I applied for and became a congressional fellow, worked on the Hill for a year and got immersed in it. I worked first for Don Fraser, the congressman from Minneapolis, my hometown, who had uh, become the chair of the what was called the Democratic Study Group, which was the sort of liberal caucus. But it, they led these reform efforts that transformed uh, the House. And then I went to the Senate for several months. And after that, I wrote my dissertation, uh, got my, uh, was ready to get my PhD, went to teach in Italy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, and then came back to teach at Catholic U. What struck me, it's a long roundabout way of saying this, what struck me, John, was that even the political scientists, the congressional scholars, the American politics people in Washington could just as easily have been in Carbondale. Um, they didn't uh, interact at all with what was going on. And I was far more immersed in politics and in Congress itself. So Early on, uh, as I was teaching at Catholic U, I was also regularly going to the Hill. I was consulting with people. And then I began uh, another part of my career, which was a, a more public uh, focus. So in 1972-73, I started to write for the Washington Post book reviews and, and op-eds, and also the New York Times. 
And then uh, I got a call from uh, public television. You know, back in the early 1970s, we didn't have cable uh, TV. We didn't have cable news. We had three networks and public television. And when the Watergate hearings started in 1973, they were the only ones covering it gavel to gavel. And it was uh, Robert McNeil and uh, Paul Duke and Jim Lehrer, who had also started the McNeil Lehrer Report right around that time. And they wanted people to come and, uh, and comment who knew something about politics. So I began to do some television as well. And the uh, most back then, writing for newspapers was bad for your career as a political scientist. You weren't supposed to interact with the public. You were to interact with the academic world and the academic community. And, and I thought that public education and uh, using my academic credentials, the historical footing and all the rest of it to enlighten the public on what was going on in politics was actually a good thing. Fortunately, my peers uh, at the university were okay with that as long as I also did the academic work. Uh, but it, you know, it became a different facet of the career that I had uh, in academia and before I ended up moving to the think tank, which was really like a, um, a connection between the public and the academic world and the political world. Right. Well, Norm, I, I, later on, I want to circle back to your work at AAI and the think tank and some of the yeah. longer term uh, projects that you're interested in and made contributions to. But I know lots of people are really, really interested on, in your take on current events, you know, the presidential campaign. And I might just say in a bit of context, when you and I first met in early July, you know, Biden had suffered that disastrous debate a few weeks earlier. He was struggling enormously. And I, I said to you, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And you said, well, he's either going to leave gracefully on his own terms, or he's going to be forced out by a thousand defections. And as it happened, it was closer to the latter scenario. But, you know, Biden did leave the race and and pick it up from there. I mean, I know one of the things we talked about a little bit is whether, you know, Harris was ready to uh, to kind of move into prime time. And uh, it seems like she uh, has flown out of the gates and has been really, really is performing strongly. So pick it up from there. So I, one thing I'll say about the debates, John, was, as we had discussed back then, um, in the first 30 seconds when Biden came onto the debate stage, it was clear it was going to be a really bad evening. Um, the first 30 seconds of Kamala Harris coming on the debate stage with Donald Trump, it was clear it was going to be a really bad evening for Donald Trump. From the first thing that she did, walking over into his space, shaking his hand, putting out her hand, forcing him to do something he did not want to do, but making clear who the alpha candidate was there. And it went on from there. Um, frankly, most people who have been around this White House were not at all certain that she was going to be able to move as quickly, as smoothly, uh, as energetically, as impressively as she did right out of the gate. And not just right out of the gate. It was entirely possible that there would be an enormous amount of resentment from the Biden people, a belief that quietly she'd been preparing for this and maybe even helping to accelerate it. None of that happened. Biden did leave with a lot of grace, but as you say, it wasn't something that he really wanted to do. But the fact that she moved on as uh, easily, as expeditiously, as impressively as she did <clears throat> from the moment that Biden, to his great credit, endorsed her, keeping this from becoming uh, you know, a shit show uh, with weeks to go with a divisive campaign for a nomination and was able to integrate her own people into a campaign filled with Biden people, some of whom were not particularly close to her, is really quite remarkable. 
and that she's handled it as well as she had since, including through the choice of her own vice presidential candidate. Having said that, and knowing that after the debate and in its aftermath, that she's moved into a significant lead in uh, overall uh, public standing in polls and uh, reversing the course, which was a downward path in the swing states. We know a couple of other facts here, John. The first is that Trump's support is unlikely to decline no matter what. Um, I would refine what Trump said in 2016. He could take an AR-15 in broad daylight on Fifth Avenue and mow down the entire street and he wouldn't lose a vote. No matter what he says or does, that's fixed. And that means he's probably around 46, 47% in the vote. And given the tilt of the system towards small states, uh, the Electoral College is not a neutral object, to say the least. We're heading for a close election. And let's hope, frankly, not because we need Democrats per se to win, but for the sake of democracy, that it turns out to be more comfortable uh, than even it was in 2020. When Biden won a clear electoral vote margin, won a big popular vote margin, but the swing states were close enough that he could claim that the election was rigged and have way too many people agree with him that led to the disaster of January 6th. Now, with that, we know a couple of things. We know that for uh, Kamala Harris to win, uh, and to win without any serious question, she needs an energized Democratic Party base, and she needs to win over especially suburban, college-educated voters who would otherwise normally vote Republican or who are independents and have not necessarily followed this that closely. I think she is in very good shape on both those fronts, both from the debate, from the actions of Trump and his, frankly, loathsome running mate, uh, J.D. Vance. And they may even put other states in play. Uh, among other things, there are close to a half a million Haitian Americans who can vote in South Florida. And that may make a difference with these vile attacks on Haitians in Springfield, Ohio. The combination of Vance saying that school shootings are a fact of life while rejecting any efforts to do things like universal background checks on guns or red flag laws or waiting periods much less an assault weapons ban, um, will help, I think, with suburban voters who send their kids to school and who don't want to have as a fact of life that you don't know whether they'll be back that afternoon or, or have them inculcate the idea that they have to prepare for an exit strategy or go under their desks or whatever that might be. And that combined with the Dobbs decision and its aftermath with Project 2025 and its uh, horrible set of radical policy ideas, we have video of Trump saying when they initiated this, this is my blueprint for uh, the presidency. So when he says he's never heard of it and doesn't know anything about it, it's simply a lie. Um, that will help. But we also know something else, which is that the Senate could easily go Republican. And even if Kamala Harris wins the presidency, if the Republicans take the Senate, she will have a very, very difficult time getting any of her cabinet or sub subcabinet people uh, in office, much less getting judges. So we're at a difficult point in a very dystopian time with the Republican Party where it is. Norm, let's go back to the debate for a moment, because the one thing that struck me was the balance that Harris tried to walk between, you know, being strong and assertive and energizing the Democratic base and and really getting them fired up and also being careful 
to reach out to, as you put the kind of the Nikki Haley Republicans, the 10, 15, 20 percent. And I remember thinking as I was watching the debate, why she I was wondering why she didn't step forward and defend the administration's record more, which I think she could have, or step forward and defend Biden a bit more, um, even in kind of an off the cuff saying, you know, Donald Trump, you don't deserve to carry his golf clubs. But it, it struck me later on that she was just being very, very careful not to alienate Republicans gratuitously, because she may need 8, 10, 12 percent of them to win states like Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. I, I think you've hit it exactly right, John. You know, she's found plenty of opportunities, including at the convention, to praise Biden and to crow about their accomplishments. This is trying to look forward and to say to people who are not all that thrilled with the Biden administration that it's a new generation of leadership. One of the things that impressed me the most is, uh, let's face it, a woman on that stage faces obstacles that a man does not. Being assertive is often turned into being shrill. Uh, being warm is often too emotional. She threaded that needle beautifully. She looked confident and presidential. She was able to get under Trump's skin to trigger him. You know, three minutes in, talking about crowd size, I think from that moment on, there was no way that Trump was going to be able to answer any question because it was a devastating thing to him. To refer to him as weak, uh, all of that worked for her. But she was also able, I think, to make a pitch to those voters. And the substantive answer that to me was the most significant was the one about abortion and the response to Trump in that sense. And I do think that the the fact that so many Republicans, including Trump, are trying to dance away from their positions on abortion. And remember, we had Trump at one point saying that women should be punished for having an abortion. He has over and over again praised the, uh, the Dobbs decision and his Supreme Court nominees. He has said it's up to the states. But when we see women, as she noted, bleeding out in, on emergency room floors or in their cars, and another story today about a woman in Georgia who died because she couldn't get any help for 20 plus hours as she bled to death, leaving a six-year-old behind. All of that is a part of this landscape and has to have an impact. And it's part of why the gender uh, gap, the fact that women are so strongly supporting her, uh, will work to her advantage. And I think she's being helped now by the reality that a significant number of prominent Republicans, including Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney, including so many of former Trump cabinet and White House people are supporting her, will make a difference. As I said earlier, it's not going to make a difference with that base that's with him no matter what. And it's futile to go after members of that base to try and convince them otherwise. But there are lots of Republicans who don't want this mess again. And I think at some point she can double down on the issue of whether we're going to continue to have a democracy that will also make a difference with some of those voters and perhaps activate portions of the base, including some of the younger people of color um, who are on the fence. Norm, just to talk a, a bit about tactics, I, after the debate, I, I saw Gavin Newsom, I think it was on MSNBC, and he said, and I'm going to quote a couple sentences, he said, this is a game of inches in the swing states. You've got to attach yourself to 20, 30, 40,000 voters in these key swing districts. It's about 30 or 40 counties within those swing states. Talk a little bit about the ground game that is going to determine the outcome of this election. So one of the things that struck me about uh, Harris is that this last week, she went to very red areas in Pennsylvania, areas that are not going to vote for her. But one of the mistakes that the Hillary Clinton campaign made in 2016 was to say it won't make any uh, 
eff we won't make any effort to go into those red areas. But the fact is, in a game of inches, if you can turn areas that would be 80-20 into 70-30 or 60-40, those votes are just as good, if not better, than the ones you would get from the blue areas or the purple areas. So she's not making that mistake. And she's trying at minimum to get people who are uneasy about Trump and may not be thrilled with her to either not vote or vote for somebody else other than him. And that may be helpful to her in some of these places. And, you know, I... I have very warm feelings towards Joe Biden. I met him when he first came to the Senate in 1973. I was doing a book on the Senate. I was a very young academic trying to meet with senators, had real trouble getting them to meet with a young academic who wasn't from their state. The Biden people said, he'll give you 15 minutes. I went in an hour and a half later, I came out and he said, call me again tomorrow. Um, and I've known him since. Uh, and he's had a remarkable level of success in his presidency. I really believe that as a one-term president, he's going to go down as a historic figure. But the fact is, he was underwater as a candidate. And far too many people, including Democrats, were looking at this as, I don't really want either of these guys. Now they have an alternative. And they can look at that alternative, but they can also decide that they don't have to vote for Donald Trump because it could be at least a little better. So she's running, I think, a very good campaign and really has enough money now. The money's been flowing in to do that ground game. And on the other side, the money going into the Republican National Committee and going into the Trump campaign that was supposed to go to a ground game is now going to pay his legal fees or to fatten his own coffers. So there's no significant Republican ground game. What we have to be concerned about is that they will use voter suppression, voter intimidation in states like Georgia, North Carolina, uh, and Arizona to try to uh, obviate the impact that her ground game will have. And, you know, just to pick one example, in North Carolina, we know that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was on the ballot, had qualified for the ballot, passed the deadline. They'd already printed ballots. And the North Carolina Supreme Court, four partisan justices, violated their own state law and constitution to say, he gets to go back on the ballot because they think that that will help Trump. And it's going to cost taxpayers millions of dollars because they have to go back and reprint the ballots. But it also means they've delayed early voting by three weeks or more. And that's because they believe that the early voting, including on campuses and in those suburban areas, was going to benefit Harris. So we're going to see some really vile tactics used to try and obviate the uh, the ground game that Harris has that Trump does not. Well, Norman, let's say that there is a sort of a 2020 scenario where, as, as you pointed out, you know, Biden won the national vote by about 7 million. But as I recall the numbers, like a 45,000 vote shift in three states would have allowed Trump to win the Electoral College. So if Harris were to win roughly in those same dimensions, you know, a very large popular vote, a very, very narrow vote in a couple states that, you know, wins the Electoral College, what what happens next? I mean, are we going to have, and I guess a lot depends on who wins the House, because yeah. Hakeem Jeffries is presiding over the, the, the counting of ballots, it might be different than if it's Mike Johnson. So tell me about, and without scaring people on another January 6th scenario, if, if Harris were to win narrowly, how events are likely to ensue in November, December, and January? Well, one very positive thing that happened uh, is a revision of the Electoral Count Act, which makes it much less likely that they can pull some kind of chicanery to try and either 
overturn the results of the election or keep it from being decided uh, because nobody will have a majority of electoral votes, in which case the election goes to the House. But remember, it's not just the majority of the House, John. The Constitution says that if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, the House decides the presidency by state. So there are 50 votes and a majority, 26 are needed to win. And the Republicans have majorities in 27 states right now. And even if they lose the House, they're more likely than not to have at least those 26 states. Now, frankly, if they don't have the 26, if nobody has 26 votes and the House can't decide, the Senate chooses a vice president by a regular vote, 100 votes, 51 uh, necessary to win. And under those circumstances, you could have a vice president selected who then becomes acting president on January 20th. And if the Senate goes to the Republicans, that would mean J.D. Vance as acting president, which is chilling, to say the least. Uh, so we still have to worry a little bit about this. There are still opportunities for bad actors and bad actions to muck up the works. And we know that not just Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, but senators like Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton when pressed on whether they would, if the results of the election show that Kamala Harris has won, embrace that result, have not been willing to do so. There's still, what we know with Trump is, if I lose by definition, the election is rigged. And we also have to worry a little bit, John, about the courts. The courts stepped up impressively, including Trump appointed or nominated judges, including the Supreme Court, to deny his efforts to overturn the election. Given where the Supreme Court is, and that includes John Roberts, if you happen to read, if others have, if you haven't, do so. The New York Times lengthy take in the paper yesterday about how John Roberts engineered this uh, result giving a president absolute immunity for official actions and saying that even if he violated the law with unofficial acts, that he can't, you can't use as evidence things that he did to accomplish those illegal acts in the courts. Uh, we can't be certain about this. And that's why we have to hope that the results are better for Harris than they were for Biden in 2020. And remember in Georgia, uh, which was ground zero for his efforts to overturn the election, we have uh, an electoral commission with Republicans uh, dominating it, who have tried to make sure that the results will not be certified even if Harris wins the state uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, so, you know, there's still things to be concerned about. Fortunately, there are lots of groups out there, and I think it will include, I hope it will include, the uh, Justice Department, the Merrick Garland Justice Department, working to make sure that these illegal traitorous acts do not uh, affect the outcome. Well, Norm, let's talk a little bit about how we got to this moment. And no one has been, frankly, uh, further ahead of the curve on this than you and your colleague, Tom Ann, because since the 90s, you know, you have been saying that the single most, and maybe even before then, but at least I remember the 90s, saying that the single most concerning development in American politics has been the change in the Republican Party, that it's no longer a traditional conservative party, but has become kind of a radicalized Party. And I want to read something. This is something you wrote a little bit later in 2012, and then have you pick up on the broader theme. You and Tom Mann write, the Republican Party has become an insurgent outlier, ideologically extreme, contemptuous of the inherited social and economic policy regimes, scornful of compromise, unpersuaded unpers by conventional understanding 
of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of political opposition. Talk about how the Republican Party has changed and what its consequences are for um, American politics. Sure. And, you know, just to give a little more background, John, in my 50 plus years of being immersed in Congress, working on reforming our political institutions and sometimes in substantive areas, uh, including mental health policy, I have worked with literally hundreds of Republicans. I actually worked with and had a very good relationship with Chuck Percy, who represented what the Republican Party used to be like, not just in Illinois, but around the country. Uh, and uh, I found, as I went through I, you know, uh, uh, that book, uh, The uh, Broken Branch, was dedicated to two members uh, of Congress, uh, both from New York. Republican Barbara Conable, uh, who was a conservative, uh, a, a brilliant man, great public servant, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, so with that context, Tom and I, being immersed in this process, saw gradually the change from a party that was a center-right party, but very much an institutionalist party, a party that wanted to solve problems, a party that wanted to work across the lines to find bipartisan ways of resolving those issues. When Pat Moynihan had said, we don't do social policy with one party alone because you need a broader buy-in from the country, that was a, a, a framework. And it began to change in the 90s. And it changed much more rapidly when uh, Newt Gingrich took the House and it was 16 years of working towards this, deliberately tribalized our politics. It became even more true when he was replaced by Dennis Hastert, who became a partisan actor instead of a Speaker of the House, trying to jam through policies with one party alone by the narrowest margins, violating the rules on a regular basis to benefit uh, George W. Bush uh, and uh, and uh, other Republican presidents. And then it accelerated to a point where uh, we felt we had to write what we wrote in 2012. And I lost a lot of Republican friends, current then current members of Congress who didn't want that message that it was the fault of the Republicans. But I can also tell you, John, that so many former Republican members of Congress came up to me to say, thank you for trying to save our party. Because what many took as an attack on Republicans was actually something quite the opposite. The country cannot survive as a democracy without a thriving two-party system, where you have parties that may have vast differences in policy, but understand that they have to work together to solve problems. And we have lost all of those, including Illinois' own Adam Kinzinger. Uh, and uh, if we don't do something to restore that party, and it's something that Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, among others, understand that it's got to take a devastating defeat across the board for the current iteration of the Republican Party, which is a cult, not a traditional party, to begin to create traction for what would be a very conservative party, but a problem-solving one. And it's not just inside. It's not just what Gingrich did that then led to uh, an environment where a Donald Trump could emerge and become the leader of a radical cult. But it's also outside forces, Fox and talk radio, Rush Limbaugh and others uh, creating the Federalist Society, uh, creating a, a group of judges who are far more driven by ideology and partisanship than they are by the oath of office that they take, that has led us to a place where the very foundations of our democracy and our values of civility and democratic small d 
uh, interactions are threatened. Norm, we had an event with Ray LaHood a couple, about a month ago, actually. Yeah. And and Ray made the point that, you know, he's part of the, uh, he's for, for, for Vice President Harris, he and Governor Edgar, a former Republican governor of yeah. Illinois. And, uh, but Ray made the point, he said, you know, if we lose this election decisively, maybe we can turn the page. And, and I know that many hope that, but I also know that you have a theory that parties have to lose three elections and they have to lose decisively. So what, I mean, and I've also heard you say that you think that the Republican party may be in the cusp of a, a literally a generational battle between sort of the Liz Cheney sort of trying to rebuild a conservative party. Yeah. And then maybe sort of the, the still the remnants of the, the Trump movement that are not going to go away. So uh, let me preface this by saying, John, I was I'm friends with Ray LaHood. I think the world of Ray LaHood. I was close with Bob Michael, who uh, for whom he had worked before moving into Congress himself. I'm afraid his son, Darren, is not quite where the father is on this with the Republican Party, and that's not all that unusual. But I think you're exactly uh, right about this. And what concerns me at the moment is uh, the way our politics generally work, as you know, the cycle is that a president comes in and the midterm election that follows works against that party in power. And what we saw, Barack Obama wins comfortably and brings Democratic majorities in in 2008. And there's an enormous backlash in 2010. Republicans win more seats in the House than they had in a century. They uh, do extraordinarily well in the Senate, and they think they found the right formula. Then they lose again in 2012, and they get the same thing in 2014. So instead of saying, oh my God, we're in trouble, they double down on what they've done. The three election scenario is you lose once and you say, ah, how could we have picked that idiot as a candidate? You lose a second time and you say, oh, we did it again. And the third time you're saying, maybe it's something more than just the candidate. And you begin to revise how you're gonna approach the American people, both in terms of your rhetoric and perhaps the way you approach policy. But it's hard to get that three times in a row, three strikes you're out uh, thing. Now, we have had in some ways two of those. Even though Republicans were able to win the House in uh, 2022, they thought they were going to have a red wave, and it turned out to be nothing close to that. They lost state legislatures, they lost the Senate, and didn't have what they thought would work. If they don't pick up the Senate, if they lose the House and lose the presidency this time, if they s suffer some defeats in those state legislatures, I really think the LaHood, Cheney, Kinsinger wing of the Republican Party can at least begin to make a change. It's not going to happen overnight. But the fact is, if they win the Senate, knowing who where the next wave of candidates will come from, the farm system, the school boards, the state legislatures, the party officials, they're all basically to the right of the Freedom Caucus. And so it's gonna take a while before it happens. But if they win the presidency this time with Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, given where they are with judges, given what they'll do to stack the deck with even more judges, given what they're going to be able to do to basically make sure that there are not elections in the future that are free and fair, that at minimum we end up with the role model, the one that Trump cited in the debate as his character witness, Viktor Orban, who has created a Potemkin village of a democracy in Hungary with courts that are stacked so that they can't lose, an election system that on the surface looks fair, but one where Orban and his party cannot lose, with a press corps that is 
free unless they criticize the people in power, in which case the publishers, the journalists are hauled off to jail or they're hit with tax bills that force them into bankruptcy. That's where we're headed as a country. So this election really is a pivotal one. It is an existential one, in my view. Well, Norm, you've had a read on Donald Trump's appeal better than an awful lot of people. And you wrote a, a really much noticed essay in The Atlantic in 2015. So this is well before a year before he was elected. And the headline was, maybe this time is really different. And you made reference to the fact you said the desire for an insurgent non-establishment figure is deeper and broader than in the past. Um, how do you explain the Trump phenomena? Uh, and let me just play off this. I mean, it seems in some of your writings, you've said that he's been able to hit sort of the two nerves of both economic anxiety and dislocation, and also kind of the social cultural fear that the country is changing in ways that people are not comfortable with. Explain Donald Trump to our audience. Okay. And let me say, John, that that piece was in part a response to the conventional wisdom in political science, which is that, you know, they may flirt with an outsider, but they always come back to the establishment candidate, the heir apparent. The heir apparent in 2016, of course, was Jeb Bush. But you could see a populist and anti-establishment mood that had been building for some time. It was there, let's go back, early 90s, 1992. It was Pat Buchanan challenging George Herbert Walker Bush probably undermining his ability to win re-election uh, back then. Uh, then you go forward. And of course, we had the populist move on the left with Ralph Nader at that point and in the center with Ross Perot. The trade issue made a difference. Populism has been there in our country since its founding, but it usually recedes when the economy gets better. So you go to 2010, the Tea Party movement was a populist movement that was built on that economic dislocation, but we ignored at that point the underlying reality, which was so many of those Tea Party people who were encouraged and incited and abetted by what uh, they uh, self-described uh, uh, young guns, Paul Ryan uh, and Kevin McCarthy and uh, Eric Cantor, who went out there and incited them, it was also the cultural differences and race. It was, let's face it, a country becoming uh, soon one where a majority of Americans are not traditional whites, where white, where blue collar whites were uneasy about what was going on. Trump was able to appeal in 2016 to rural and small town America people who saw their traditional jobs going away, people who saw dislocation, the kind of dislocation and social disintegration that J.D. Vance wrote about in Hillbilly Elegy, people who thought that the big cities, the East and West Coast elites condescended to them, didn't care at all about them. And Trump said, I'm with you. I hear you. I'm against those people as well. And that resonated with a lot of people who ignored their own economic self-interest because Trump didn't give them anything. And even now, you look at his tax plans, it screws over uh, blue collar people and people struggling to give even more to billionaires and multimillionaires and big corporations. But those values issues, the fact that you say, I'll stick it to those people that you hate, resonates. And he is able to do that instinctively uh, and brilliantly and have that appeal to people. And it's reinforced by the media that they listen to and now by the power of social media doing exactly the same thing. So Trump has that appeal. Now, if he loses, I think he disappears from the scene he will end up having a, a world of hurt with his legal issues. His businesses are going to falter. And will anybody else replace him? I'm not sure you have a figure who has the same resonance. 
But the fact is that populism is now the core of the Republican Party, and it's not going away anytime soon. And whether a more traditional conservatism, there's a new biography of Ronald Reagan by Max Boot. Um, I have not read it, but it was uh, very interesting in the review in uh, the uh, New York Times yesterday, the Washington Post yesterday, about how uh, uh, and what Reagan's people and, uh, and uh, family are saying that the Reagan Republicanism, which was built around free trade, spreading democracy abroad, building our alliances that were built on democracy, is gone now. That Reagan would not vote for Donald Trump, could not support Donald Trump. It's a very different Republican Party, but it's uh, Trump didn't cause it. Trump is the accelerant. And only the only way to get rid of it down the road, if you have a fire and you have an accelerant, first you have to put out that part driven by the accelerant before you can turn to the rest of the blaze. Norm, a couple of months ago, we had a conversation with John Hamry, the, the head of CSIS, and he was talking broadly about American politics and American life. And he said that he thinks that we are sort of at the front edge of about a 20-year period of really profound dislocation in which the two major parties may undergo almost fundamental changes. I mean, what do you see as you look at your crystal ball in the, the coming decade or two? Well, uh, first, you know, moving past the possibility that we will blow up our democracy entirely, I think John is, is right. We know, first of all, that we're going to see enormous dislocations in not just our society, but around the world. We're going to see it because of the incredible rise of new technologies that always take a period of time before they settle down. There's a wonderful little book that never got the attention it deserved called The Victorian Internet, which was about the rise of the telegraph and the dislocation that it caused for decades. Then we had, you know, radio, television, the internet. Now we have artificial intelligence. All of that will play out in ways that are going to cause dislocations with people. Look what's happening with climate and climate change. And among other things, we're going to see an increased severity in storms and inability of people to be able to deal with them. Insurers leaving states like Florida and Mississippi and Alabama or raising their rates because they're not going to be able to afford what happens when people's homes or businesses are destroyed or the infrastructure is destroyed. You look at the global economy with artificial intelligence. What kinds of jobs are going to be there? Where are we going to find some stability? One of the things that's worked in our society is that it's the urban areas, the big industrial areas, the cities and the suburbs around them that have managed well because you have the education infrastructure, the information infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, and people who understand that they may have a different job in two or three years, that they're going to have to retool. And other areas, as you move out to the exurbs and the small towns and the rural areas, that have not been able to adjust as well. That's going to accelerate down the road. And will the parties be able to adjust to that? We don't know. But what we also know is that alliances are changing and warfare is changing. And we are probably not going to have wars with big armies anymore. But look at what's happened with these little drones. Look what's happened when people like the Houthis in a small country like Yemen are able to alter the course of warfare and get away with it. So all of those things, I'm sure John talked about them, are going to uh, require our parties, even if they're run by the best people, even if we have uh, a governmental system, which is archaic, our constitution doesn't work in this kind of environment the way it should. Uh, I'll mention one thing, uh, John, that I haven't to this point. Uh, I know we're running a little bit over, but uh, we're almost at a point where 70% of Americans live in 15 of our 50 states. Now that's because People move where the jobs are, and that's where the large cities and the, uh, you know, those 15 states represent more than two-thirds of our GDP. Well, think about what that means. 
a greater tilt in the Electoral College. 50% of Americans live in eight states. But what it also means is that we're almost at a point where 30% of Americans will elect 70 United States senators. And they're not representative of the diversity or the economic dynamism of the country. And one of the things that's going to happen, just because of the structural anomalies in a constitution built for the 18th century that doesn't work as well in the 21st century, is that those 30% with 70 senators are going to have the most devastating impact from climate change. And they're going to want to take more money from the 30 senators and the 15 states that they represent to deal with their problems. They are the welfare states, actually. And you're going to see more and more of a sense that the elections are not legitimate and that uh, they're being shaken down in those states. So we've got challenges ahead that are enormous if we can restore some functionality to our political system. And we're not alone. The globe is going to face and already is facing those same challenges. And we're seeing as a result right wing populism emerging in many European countries. And, you know, Le Pen in France could well prevail. She's come within an eyelash before. Far right parties in Germany. We see what's happened with Hungary, uh, with the Czech Republic. Poland, at least emerging from this with a, 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 a demise in the last election of the more populist right wing party. But we're seeing it around the globe and we're going to have challenges. And what about the next generations that are very different in their views towards social issues, more adept at using the new technologies, but also unsettled because they don't know where their jobs are going to be? Well, Norm, thank you for an amazing conversation. And I, it just reinforces uh, my idea that we need to get you to campus maybe this spring to spell out some of these broader uh, broader concerns and themes. I know you've done some really remarkable work on you know, the Electoral College, expanding Congress and so forth. So we're gonna, be, we're gonna stay in touch and I'm gonna find a way to bring you and Judy to campus uh, sometime next spring. Thanks, John, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We'll have a video of this conversation on our website in the coming days. Please share it with family and friends. And thank you for keeping the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.